Welcome to my channel, The Binge Eating Therapist. I'm Sarah, former binge eater turned psychotherapist, and my mission is to use this space to bring content to you that will help you understand your struggle with food and break free from binge eating. And today's video is another instalment of uh, my series of binge eating recovery stories, um, where I've been interviewing people who have recovered from binge eating and have been very generous um, enough to share their stories. I think there's a lot we can learn from hearing other people's stories, a lot of hope to be gained, um, and today's a really good one. I'm interviewing Zoe Klein, who lives in Toronto, Canada. She's a licensed social worker, which for those of us in the UK, really means she's more like a therapist than what we think of as a social worker. They use titles a little bit differently there. And I've been following Zoe for a while on Instagram. She is at Zoe Klein Social Work, if you want to check out her content. And this is a really good episode. I really enjoyed meeting Zoe. She's got a lot of interesting things to say. She struggled with binge eating for years without realizing that this was what she was struggling with. Um, she got accused of just not being very intelligent when she tried to get some help for her binge eating. So, um, and now she works um, in Toronto, helping other people recover from binge eating. So I hope you enjoy this um, video and I will see you on the next one. Hi Zoe. Hello, how are you? Yeah, good. Thank you so much for joining me today and do, agreeing to do this interview. Yeah, I think it will be fun and it's, it's an important topic. I'm happy to discuss. Yeah, and actually I've been following you on Instagram for a while and when I decided to start doing these interviews, you were somebody that I was really keen on speaking to because you put a lot of work into your infographics and you share a lot about your own experience as well. So um, I really wanted to get you on because I think that people watching this um, could probably get quite a lot out of what you've got to say. So Thank you. would you be happy to start by telling us a little bit about your experience with binge eating? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually was never formally diagnosed with binge eating, but by the time I got to graduate school, um, I was in my mid-20s at the time, and we were learning about binge eating disorder in a unit that we were doing in one of our courses. And I realized that for over a decade, not at that time, but for a little bit before that, I met all of the diagnostic criteria for binge eating disorder. Um, at the, and because I was never diagnosed, a lot of those symptoms were dismissed as laziness, as um, one healthcare provider unfortunately said it was a symptom of lack of intelligence, which I'm never going to forget. Um, and it was really, really blown off as somebody who didn't have self-control. And when I saw that this was actually a mental health concern and medical issue that people can get support for, I had a lot of feelings about it. And that was really what helps me go into a career that was based on eating disorders because I thought about the fact that if I'm in this position where I'm sitting here and I'm learning about something that I likely had for a, for a good period of my life and wasn't given the right support, there have to be more people in this situation. And what I've come to learn since is there's a lot of women in the, that situation. Mm -hmm. Gosh, my goodness, it sounds like you were really let down. And interesting, you say lack of intelligence, lazy. Um, did you say willpower? You said something about willpower? Yes, yes yeah. willpower. Yeah. yeah, I think those are a lot of the things that a lot of people think of when they're judging themselves for binge eating. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think that especially, I think people of all genders first and foremost, but I think that women are taught from a young age and sadly, a lot of the time by their mothers or their aunts, like, oh, if you had that cookie, like, oh, I have no willpower, or I couldn't resist the cake, right? So that language gets embedded into a child from very, very early on. So before they're even told that their eating disorder is a result of lack of willpower, which of course it isn't, they've come to that conclusion on their own. Mm -hmm. So for you, you realized yourself that this was binge eating that you had as a result of learning about it in the course of studying. Yes. Yes. I think had I never come across that, if I had gone into a different career or 
maybe that wasn't discussed that day, I, I probably wouldn't have been able to contextualize that information. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, I remember our professor in that course said, guys, you're, we're going to be learning about a lot of stuff. Try to not diagnose yourself and others. But in this situation, it was hard not to because every single thing fit. And I understand what this person was saying, which was like, don't go down the rabbit hole of thinking you have like five to seven things that you may or may not have. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, it's like all of this fit. Yeah. Yeah. And so how did you get out? So I'll just go backwards a little bit and I'll go to maybe I think like the year, year and a half before graduate school. Um, so this was quite a while ago. I had decided at the time that I had food addiction, which is of course not a thing, but many people in this position do feel that way because of what they're told. So um, I approached the situation by um, cutting out a huge variety of food, um, which I'm of course not going to share on this platform because I don't think that's a good idea, but I did do it. And I believed that I needed to abstain that that's who I was, that I couldn't quote unquote handle certain foods. So by the time I got to graduate school, I wasn't binging, but it was a result of severe, severe restriction. So I think because we know that re restriction is a huge precursor, it could have perhaps come back during a stressful moment. So that was not really a way to recover. So once I started to realize that this was something I had had and I had perhaps gone about it in the wrong, gone about recovery in the wrong way because total restriction is not recovery. I was put in a situation where I recovered on my own and it was through reading articles and journal articles about best practices and reintroducing foods. But I do have to say that this is not advised. It's really, really important to go speak to a therapist, a dietitian, a doctor, whoever you can, because it's important to have specific guidance when you go through the recovery process. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that worked for me, but I think that, the trial and error process is something that should really, really occur with the help of trained professionals. Yeah. But I think a lot of people can relate to that, that the answer somehow lies in managing to like tie yourself up in chains around food so that you can't binge. If you're not allowed these foods, then you can't be out of control and binge on them. But that comes yes. at a cost, right? Yes, it does. It does. And um, that definitely came to at various costs from you, which I'll discuss later, but it, at the time, I think what it also did is isolated quite, quite a bit. So what I always tell clients is it's one thing to say, I don't like this food or I don't feel like this food right now, or, you know, I'd rather only, I'd rather have half of this today. But I think that it's another thing to say, I can't be trusted I am not like you, so I'm therefore going to sit at home and miss events. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then what was the kind of price or the cost on, I'm assuming that it just affects relationships and socializing and... Yeah, it did. It did. And I think that I wasn't making choices from a place of achievement. Like people would go out and do things. And when you're younger in your 20s, there's a lot of dinner and drinks and weekend events. And... I think it's, again, it's one thing to say, I don't want to go to this bar or I don't want to go here because I don't really like that sort of thing, right? Not, I don't want to go to that bar because they might serve tortilla chips and I'm too addicted to be there. Mm -hmm. So then, so for you, you were stuck in binging for a while. Then you self-diagnosed at the time as being a food addict. So I can't control myself. I'm out of control. I can't have these foods. You were restrictive. And then like, how did you find balance after that? Well, it was difficult because after that particular lecture where I was learning about binge eating disorder and I was doing subsequent research, I would pick a food and try to reintroduce it and do so in small amounts um, without getting into the details of it. Because again, I think recovery needs to be really individualized. But I think some of the good that came out of that was I learned that I actually didn't like food that I previously binged on or... Mm -hmm there were some things that I liked that I did want to have in certain quantities and um, 
that I could be trusted. And I think that the food addiction label is damaging not only for the person, but it's damaging in terms of how society reinforces it. So there was definitely a bit of an identity moment of, I don't actually think I'm a food addict because A, that's not a thing, but also there were reasons, you know, looking back on my life and what was happening at the time, there were reasons why those pinches were happening. And I think that that's something that I've really taken with me in terms of the care I give my clients, which is looking at what are these binges trying to tell us? So like in short, the recovery process, I would say, despite lack of guidance was very good um, and taught me a lot about how I want to provide treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then do you have an idea in your mind about how binge eating started for you, like right at the beginning, how it became a problem or why it became a problem? Yeah. So, um, it started in full force after a diet I did in fifth grade. And I would say before that, like, I definitely like left to my own devices, would eat a lot of candy or would want a big slice of cake. But I don't think that that was in a dangerous way. I think a lot of little kids are like that where, you know, you say, guys, do you want to make an ice cream sundae? And they'll make a big one and, you know, enjoy it with their whole face. Right. But I would say that's pretty normal. Um, but when I was in fifth grade, I decided I wanted to go on a diet and, um, I've always been sort of a medium sized person. Um, so I don't know at the time if it was weight driven or if it was more how I felt about myself because what was really popular at that point in the um, 90s and early 2000s was those um, videos with those transformations and those American high schools where they would come in and they would look really different. And I was very like nerdy and bookish. And I think that was something I wanted. Um, but I think because I was sort of middle of the road body size, no one necessarily stopped me either because they thought, Oh, you know, she's trying to be healthy. She's trying to be responsible. Good for her. And, um, we were enrolled in martial arts, my brother and I, and which we, which we loved. And, but all of a sudden I was waking up at six in the morning to practice our karate cut us for like a, um, a year, an hour, um, with an, with a whole other exercise, exercise routine. And, this is nobody's fault, but at the time it was very much dismissed as willpower, responsibility. And look at this child trying to think about what she's eating. Um, and that went on for like three months, four months. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I can only imagine that if I was a child in a larger body, that might've even intensified in terms of their reactions that I was getting from the public. Um, Anyway, um, at the conclusion of this diet, I saw a bunch of pizza on the table. And because you're young, you don't understand you've been on a diet, you've been deprived. So you're, you know, going to go into overdrive. So I just ate all the pizza and felt terrible about it. Mm -hmm. That so, sounds like how most diets end, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I just remember feeling guilty and horrible and like, oh my God, I'm going to gain back all this weight and no one's going to respect me anymore, which is like crazy for a fifth grader who's like 10 years old to be thinking about. But mm -hmm. um, it was there. And again, I don't blame anybody who maybe didn't see the forest or the trees here because we have to look at what we're taught. Mm -hmm. So those years then when you were binge eating and writing it, like – what was the impact of that on you and, and how you felt about yourself and your body during the time of binging? I felt gross. I felt like I was disgusting, um, that I was pig. Um, I think when you first start a binge, the food tastes really good. And then as you move through it, at the end, you feel horrible, terrible about yourself. And there's, there was a lot of media at the time, as, as there is now in different forms, with these girls who seemingly looked perfect, who um, effortlessly moved through life, right? And you think, okay, I'm going to be the loser left behind. I'm never going to be that. And it was it was terrible. And that, that moved pretty far into my late teens and early 20s as well. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So then in terms of this journey of, I don't know, your body changes and how you feel about yourself changes. If you look at like who you are today and you look at what you've been through, like, do you think, how do you think it's affected who you've become today? I think that's my question. That's a good question. I'm trying to think of how to answer that. Like, I feel like it's given me a real understanding of how careful we have to be with children and particularly girls in terms of what we tell them, in terms of the compliments that we give them, in terms of the way that we teach them about food and the way that we teach them to talk about each other because like a lot of the time what would happen is people would say things like oh you know look at this girl she's so nice and slim or so and so has such nice hair but that actually doesn't tell you anything about them and that feels binges even more because Mm -hmm. you're like okay I you know I can't measure up to this what's wrong with me right and I think it's given me a much greater awareness of as nice as it is for someone to say, you know, you're beautiful, we need to be complimenting people more than that. And we need to show our clients that they deserve to fall in love with their lives and not their bodies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I really like that. Fall in love with your life, not your body. Absolutely. I, wanna, I feel like I want to make a post out of that. <laughs> Maybe I will. <laughs> I'll credit you. I'll credit you. Um, <laughs> So one thing I just want to jump back to, because I think it's something that people will really relate to that stage where you were reintroducing fear foods. So many people where when they're in that place of control, of course, the terror is that these foods, they're going to feel really out of control again for you. That process of reintroduction. Did you have times when you felt out of control again? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I remember there was a time I was at a good friend's house in graduate school and she, uh, she had a little girl and we, uh, we were sitting there watching a movie and we had dinner and all this nice food there. And I was having a couple of Oreos. And then later, um, she went to bed and the little girl went to bed and I was lying down to sleep in like the guest room. And I kept thinking, okay, should I get up and eat more Oreos? What's going to happen if I eat more Oreos? What happens if I eat the entire, it was all of a sudden these like Oreos were basically like calling to me uh-huh. and like I ended up going to sleep because I was like, okay, you know what? You're like, I don't know if you're looking for taste right now. Like I think maybe you're feeling something else. Right. And there was that terror, but there was also that awareness of understanding even more what's feeling, which is. Would you say it was just time and practice that made that process become easier for you? Yeah, it was time. It was practice. And it was, um, and I didn't really talk to anybody about this at the time, but it was, like re you know ordering something that I thought would be a problem maybe with somebody I trusted like I would encourage clients to be vocal about that like if you're out with your partner or family member or sibling and saying okay and who's aware of the process and saying like okay you know what um I want to try to order fish and chips right now um and that person being supportive and able to help you through that is better but um in my case I found it helpful to have somebody there because it made the food something that was part of an experience right and one of the things that i want my clients to be able to get is enjoyment out of experiences is food a part of that absolutely but i want food to be a piece of the puzzle and what that means is being able to enjoy whatever with others or yourself or wherever you are but not have every situation be characterized by what you did or didn't eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, what would you say to someone else then if they were at that point where they were restricting and wanting to reintroduce foods, what might you say to them? Like if they don't really know where to start. So first of all, I really, really want to say do this with the help of a dietitian and a therapist. Because I think one of the biggest things that I've seen clients do, and it's understandable, is they'll say, I want to find food freedom. So they'll go get every single fear food, they'll put it in their house, and they'll say, I can do this with the best of intentions, and it doesn't end well. So, and then they go back into that cycle of, okay, I guess I have food addiction. So 
I think what's important is to make a list of your foods and systematically challenge those with the help of a dietitian, a therapist, and a doctor. And sure, absolutely. I think the end goal is to be able to enjoy all foods and whatever amounts feel good. But I think it's really important to go through that in a systematic and organized fashion. What about people who just can't afford it? That's a really, that, that's, that's really important. And first and foremost, I think that healthcare should not be a luxury. And I really hope that, at least in Ontario, um, one day therapy can be covered by OHIP, which is our healthcare system that allows people to get free healthcare in hospitals. I hope one day that can cover this type of therapy. Mm -hmm. um, until then, I think what's important is to follow as many therapists as you can on Instagram that promote the health at every size model, um, to listen to podcasts, to look for free resources. Um, and in terms of challenging foods, I would say make that list and go through it one by one. So if you've got chocolate at the top of your list, maybe every week you get a chocolate bar like a big one and you have a little bit each day. Um, one of my colleagues who's a dietitian, she talks to her clients about um, having a little bit with their meal. So they see that as like a fun part of their meal. Um, so of course, caveat, I'm social worker, so I'm not giving nutrition advice, but like that can be a way to reintroduce that food mm -hmm. um, in a fun way. Um, I think getting some a supportive person to maybe enjoy a figure food with you like I have some people in my practice with wonderful husbands and wives that um will sit down with them and have a cupcake and go through that experience or the cookie or whatever it may be um because I think that you you can definitely recover with a good support system um in the absence of being able to afford care mm -hmm. and so nowadays do you ever still experience that urge to binge Oh yeah, for sure. Um, recently I've had some sort of medical woes that, I'm, that I was, that I've been trying to figure out and I may all understood the, you know, what's going on with this particular issue. But as I was sort of in the process of getting tests done, oh yeah, for sure. But I think what's different now is understanding why these binges are coming up, knowing what I can do instead. And being able to redirect myself um, in the same way that I would redirect clients. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, yes, it, it, it definitely does happen. Yeah. And so then if you can go, if you could go back to like right in the middle of those 10 years when you were stuck in it, what would you say to yourself? I, I would have said that these binges or these, and these urges to binge are happening for a reason and that this has nothing to do with lack of integrity, lack of character. Um, I wish that I would have gone to my primary care physician and investigated other physical causes. Um, like one of the things I found out actually less than two months ago was that I have PCOS. And from what I understand about PCOS is that um, extreme hunger can also be one of the things that drive symptoms. And this isn't me saying that if you have PCOS, you have binge eating disorder, but knowing that there was a partial physical cause and, you know, I could have received medication also would have been good to know. And I think that people are entitled to a full spectrum of care. Yeah. 100%. And just interesting that you touched on PCOS because I reckon that, I don't know, maybe 20% of the people, the women obviously that I work with, have PCOS and the yeah. hormonal uh, things that people, women especially, uh, men too to some degree, I think have a huge part to play in like this sense of self-regulation. Yeah, yeah, ab ab absolutely. And I think like sometimes people sort of look at me sideways when I have things on my intake forums that say, when was the last time you got your thyroid checked? Or do you have any hormonal difficulties because truthfully this can play into a lot of our emotion regulation, our, you know, potential eating disorders. I think in my case, um, I was a lot more hungry than I maybe otherwise would have been. And the general sentiment around food at the time 
sort of catapulted benches. And I think what people deserve to know is if you are experiencing binge urges, whether or not you have PCOS, whether or not you have a hormonal problem, whether or not you, there may be, I don't know, any other sort of nutritional deficiencies, you still deserve the same amount of help. And I wish I could have gone back and told myself, but I don't think that someone who's 20, 21 would think this way of go to the doctor. Let's see if there's anything else going on. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think at, speaking from the perspective of a woman and, you know, of course this happens to all genders. I think it's really hard for young girls and women to come forward and say, I eat a lot. I binge in secret. I think I might have a problem because people aren't very receptive to that. And we need to change that because that's affecting the level of medical care that they're getting. Yeah. I mean, amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So much of what you said today, I think will people will really respond to and um, makes a lot of sense. Like the story that you tell me is the story that I hear over and over again with people that I work with as well. There's, our stories are so unique, but at the same time, there's so many similarities as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think anybody going through treatment right now deserves a lot of respect because they are dealing with something very difficult and they can recover then part of recovery is choices and the first good choice they made was getting therapy yeah yeah 100 percent. well i'm not going to argue with that (laughs) anyway so gosh zoe thank you so so much for coming on today sharing everything that you shared and um i'm going to pop a link to your instagram account in the description below but um yes just thank you you're welcome you're welcome okay All right then, Zoe. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.